This is Father Patrick Briscoe. This is Father Joseph Anthony Cress. Welcome to God's Planning. Thanks to all who support us. If you enjoy the show, please consider making a monthly donation on Patreon. Be sure to like and subscribe to God's Planning wherever you listen to your podcasts. Father Joseph Anthony, what's up? Not too much, man. Just living the good life. Is this this is our first episode together in studio, huh? Yes, it's been a minute since we've been together uh, in recordings, so uh, this is, it's good. Were we banned? <laughs> Did I, they you punish know, us? I was like, I could take the subtle <laughs> hits. Father, said, Father like, Jacob Bertrand said, "No, not allowed." <laughs> he's doing all the scheduling. He's like, "I will never let this happen again." <laughs> but guess what? He flew out on an airplane, so he he can't stop us. That's right. He's yeah. gone now. Exactly. Bye bye. It's all good. Well, um, here we are on this episode, which is going to be about how to plan a Catholic wedding. Yes. Which is important because we want Catholics mm-hmm. to get married in the church. That's right, we do. And there are a lot of resources available to help brides and grooms mm-hmm. in their mm-hmm. expectation, right? So, and some of those are Catholic, some of those are not, obviously. Um, and I, the most important thing um, for us as priests is that a bride and a groom are led together to pursue holiness. That they yes. realize that their wedding is about their life together with God. So our goal as we talk about this episode, I think from the very top, is to say that first. Yes. right. There are so many considerations that overwhelm mm-hmm. young men and young women who are preparing mm-hmm. for their wedding day. And yet the biggest and central factor like what the thing that the wedding day is, is that it's about a relationship with God. It's unbelievable. There's so much that goes into planning a wedding. And I think, unfortunately, very little goes into investing and planning for marriage. Mm. And this is like, yeah, we're going to talk about how to plan for a Catholic wedding in, in these things. But um, maybe that that title of the episode was like kind of just clickbaity because like I want to talk about marriage, right? <laughs> it's like a wedding is that point that initiates the life of the spouses together in marriage, in the sacrament of marriage. But it it's the initiation point, right? It's the beginning and it's not the end of anything. Um, and so I think it's really important to, to look at that as like what we are talking about is a life of holiness as husband and wife pursuing uh, their union uh, with God via the union that they have together as husband and wife. And um, in the church's beauty and wisdom and in Christ's authority and power to institute the sacraments, he elevated marriage to a sacramental reality, Mm. right? And so now he has instituted marriage, husbandry, being a wife, well, to, husbandry is about horses. Right? Well, yeah, yeah no, <laughs> let's let's thank you for that clarification. I didn't want to end up in some. Ooh, it's the internet. It's <laughs> that, the internet. That would be weird. Yeah, never mind. <laughs> but the ability to be spouse is now elevated to sanctification. Hmm. That's the super important thing. Like the church has um, her sacraments, the the means of sanctification. And that is via being the husband and wife. The spousal relationship is elevated to communicate real sanctifying grace. And that's super important to understand. Um, And so the wedding itself, that one hour on a random Saturday, you know, who knows where. Or Friday night. Or Friday night, yeah. Uh, (laughs) is It should be a celebration. It's beautiful and it's really important. And to see the, the, what is prayed through those prayers, um, this, the different images and symbols that are utilized and, and how they express the reality. But the, at the end of the day, the reality is that by this man and women, woman coming together to become husband and wife, they're communicating and deepening their union with God and each other in sanctifying grace. That's like, right. This is about holiness. Yeah, so a wedding is fundamentally, as you're saying, about a vocation, about the call to love in the particular way this man who marries this woman is called to love. Uh, when I when I describe this to couples, I always direct their attention to Christ on the cross, yes. Christ the bridegroom, mm-hmm, who mm-hmm. is united to his bride, the church. Uh, and when we look at Jesus and his death on the cross, we can actually see what makes for a complete marriage uh, because Christ in his life, and particularly his death for, for our salvation, shows us that a marriage... 
a true relationship, um, one that's going to flourish, one that is this living out of the call to love in the eyes of God, is going to be free, total, faithful, and fruitful. Mm -hmm. Christ freely accepts the cross. It's total on the cross we see Jesus giving his whole life over right. to his bride, the church, right? Dies even naked. You know, he has nothing to his person, gives his whole life over. Um, free, uh, total, faithful. This relationship that Jesus has with the church is exclusive. Um, the same way that the relationship any spouse has uh, with their spouse is exclusive. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that and that, that demands fidelity. Jesus will always be faithful to the church. He'll, right. he'll never let the church wander. Um free, total, faithful, and fruitful, from the cross springs the fullness of mm -hmm. the sacramental life, right? Mm -hmm. And the graces of the cross allow us to live our lives with God. So so when we think about, okay, what what is a wedding in the eyes of the church? That's what we're talking about. A wedding is the public, the public decision, the public moment where this call to love of a man and a woman um, in, in, the, in this union where this call to love is formalized and made public and blessed in a particular way by the church. And there's real, That's what we're talking about. There's real sacramental graces being given, mm -hmm. right? It's not just saying like, oh, we're going to make this public statement about it, but it's like there's the reception and communication of sacramental grace and sanctifying grace in that moment, that this, this man and woman now become husband and wife, and it's a bond, it's a union that the Lord forms in and amongst these other individuals, the covenant relationship, all these other things that we can talk about. But like, I just, I, I don't want to lose that aspect of the uniqueness, the beauty, the excitement really mm. at becoming right. like a husband of the wife. wedding day. Yeah. Because I, everything changes on the wedding day. Yeah. That's why this, mm. there's so it much effort put real. into it. Right. <laughs> There's a reality that like this is so beautiful that this man, woman, as becoming husband and wife, are now pursuing holiness in a totally different mode, right? And and that's just I don't know that's really exciting, and so um, I never want to lose that understanding. But like the beauty of the fact that in all, out of all the different modes that the Lord could have chosen to institute His sacraments and to say these are the communications of sanctifying grace, He elevated marriage to become that. Mm. And it's it's unique. It's privileged in that sense. Um, it's really beautiful. So when when Catholics are preparing for their wedding day, what are some of the what what are some of the first questions that they should be asking? Like provided, you know, provided that they've spoken to a priest, mm -hmm. you know, they have the date set. They've mm -hmm. you know they've done they've done all of the all of the kind of background work. They're aware of the preparations that their diocese demands. All these things are very important, right? Well, you have to get on the calendar. Yeah. You have to do marriage prep according yeah. to the form that's required. You have to line up your priest celebrant. I mean, I think part of that research, and this is something that tends to get overlooked, is who's responsible for doing the prep? Who's responsible for celebrating the wedding, mm. right? Um, I work in a university environment, so we have a lot of our students and graduates they get engaged uh, right after graduation or a few years after graduation or, or whatever it may be. And they kind of reach out to me and they're like, hey, we just got engaged. What do we do next? Mm -hmm. And it's like, OK, where are you living? Talk to your local pastor. Right. This is something that gets, um, I think, overlooked a little bit is the reality is that your local pastor is responsible for the sacramental preparation of his parishioners. Mm -hmm all the sacraments, not yeah, just first communion right. and not just confirmation, but like the entirety of sacramental preparation. So wherever you're living, and this is why it's so important to be a registered parishioner so that you know who has the responsibility for your sacramental formation, you know, and it's not, so it needs to be something that like just a simple encouragement, like if you're not registered at a parish, go because now yeah, now you, you, roots. you, you have roots. roots and now we know who has authority and responsibility for your sacramental formation, mm. right? Whether you're engaged right now or not or plan to be, please go register. Don't just chirp, chop around like you can test the waters a little bit, but find your parish, commit to that register because now that pastor is responsible for you mm. and he knows and this is my flock. He has a clarity of who his sh sheep are, who his children are to form. So the first thing is to then contact your local pastor and to see, okay, what does marriage prep look like in this parish? You know, what are the uh, regulations and, and things like that? Even if 
your wedding's taking place at a different church, right? Like I said, do college work. I mean, <laughs> I, I do mm-hmm. weddings all over the nation. I have a bunch of people coming back to Charlottesville to do their wedding in Charlottesville because it was so important to them. So the wedding may take place in one location, but it's their local pastor who does all the marriage prep. Mm-hmm. And that's where the, the, the marriage preparation, all the meetings and things like that, that'll take place. So I think that's really, really important to kind of clarify right out of the gate. Moving so once once a couple gets through all of that and they give they get some of these basic things lined up, um, you know, including please guys, you know, book the church before you book your venue. Yes, I know the yes. reception venues are important. Oh please, but it will not make or break your wedding celebration. Oh. But but nail nail down the date with the church before before you book your venue because because if you book the venue first and then the church isn't available, that that can be very. Mm-hmm. That can be very difficult. Yep. Um, it can it can cause financial burdens, um, uh, other 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 sorrows of heart, and that that can be avoided. Yes, by by ch- chasing down the the church. And I know that can be complicated sometimes. Parish mm-hmm. secretaries are limited in their availability to respond. Same same with priests, um, and that that can sometimes take some time to work out. So, and and even like uh, another um, example of that is. In, in Charlottesville, where our church is, is near the football stadium. And so we cannot have weddings when there's a home football game on those yeah, Saturdays. Yeah, that's right. There might be a reason like that that would But we don't know that football schedule until February or March Ooh. preceding. Ooh. So like the, that, there are sometimes just little things. So please don't come to the church and saying, <laughs> oh, this is the date of my wedding. It's like... Maybe, maybe we we hope possibly. <laughs> and, and every every priest is going to do his best to accommodate you. Yes, but there are there are many factors at play. So so just a word to to encourage patience and uh, talk to the priest uh, first. <laughs> talk to the church first, and then we'll figure out and the rest and of then it. everything else will follow. Yeah. Um, the for for your sense, Father Joseph Anthony, what is the most important thing a couple should be looking for uh, the day of? You know, as they're mm-hmm. as they're headed towards. Okay, so you do all the background prep. You've got yeah. the, you've got the, you've got the uh, all the all the arrangements lined up. And I'm talking about things like venue, DJ, catering, flowers, family, flowers, hotels. You, you've you've got all this lined up, which are the kinds of things that are that are uh, that are involved in planning a wedding that yeah. I do very little of and know very little about. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Despite having survived my sister's weddings and several of my cousins' weddings, all of which were fabulous, uh, yeah. they were just really, really well done and really, really fun events. And um, but, uh, but, but what what is the most important thing a couple should be looking for so that they can orient their day, you know, as they mm-hmm. plan? Because there are just many things involved in planning a wedding, right? But, but, but like, what is what is the thing a couple should be looking looking towards? How can they kind of center themselves, I guess is what I'm asking, and direct their attention? Yeah, I think one of the most important things is that you have a chance to actually pray through your wedding mass mm. before the mass. Right. Because you're going to be very distracted. And that's okay. Like that's That's not saying that you don't care about God or the sacrament, but there's just a lot going on. You're going to be standing up there thinking, ugh, did Uncle Tony, like, did his flight get delayed or what, you know? <laughs> where's the lector? Yeah, where's the lector? Like, th- those are things that just happened. So, like, I really want the couples to take some time and pray with the readings. Look over those prayers, you know. Hopefully your priest is doing this for you and with you mm-hmm. and kind of pointing some things out. But um, if you have the opportunity to kind of do some prayer beforehand so that when you are in that moment, then you can remember, like, oh, that prayer like i remember hearing that phrase before those types of things will help bring you back to the present moment and draw you out of those distractions it takes a little bit of prep work but it's really really important because that way you can be there holding the hand of your spouse Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and looking into them as you you exchange consent and and exchange rings like and holding their hands there i think those types of little things are, are really important because that does help to draw you out of the chaos and into the moment and being present to say like, yes, I am total freely uh, and and, and fruitfully giving myself to this other Mm -hmm. as spouse. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's a beautiful moment. So with all the chaos and you know, the the beautiful thing is it'll be okay. 
<laughs> like there's always something that goes wrong. It's never quote unquote perfect. I've done so many weddings. I've had to clean up shattered glass and vases in the middle of the center aisle. I've had to walk through like what seems to be like a Louisiana swamp in order to like get to the event, the reception venue. Like there's always something that goes wrong and who cares? Mm. It's about this moment becoming spouse and being surrounded by your loved ones in the presence of God. Now you jumped in right away and you said start at you as you assume planning a mass. Does every Catholic have to have a mass at their wedding? Yeah, this is this is a beautiful thing. When we when we have uh the weddings between two baptized Catholics, right? We want that to be surrounded and almost enveloped in the Eucharistic mystery. Mm -hmm. Right. You mentioned earlier Christ on the cross giving himself in that and we can see it as like this is a beautiful moment to as as husband and wife to be participating in communion um in receiving those graces to be this kind of depth of imitation and invitation of how to love each other as christ loved his church so two husbands should love their wives and you see that in the eucharistic sacrifice and when we have baptized catholics that are marrying uh, a, a baptized non-Catholic or another baptized Christian, we we en enter into that with the liturgy of the word in the nuptial rites, but it's not the full sacrifice of the mass uh, that we have there. And so it, it is a full liturgy done in the church and in, in the space with with all of its beauty and grandeur. Um, but we don't want to like highlight, you know, the the separations or the differences in those ways. So quite often in those cases, they will not be within the full context of a mass, but will be a, a nuptial ceremony, a nuptial liturgy in that way. But two Catholics could also choose not to have a mass, right? Like you don't have to have a wedding mass if you're a Catholic marrying another Catholic. You should, you know. Yeah, but you don't have to. to. You don't have to. <laughs> uh, you don't have to is the point. Yes, um, yes. And there would be good reasons not to. I was just going to say for there's example, always if, reasons. If, if the, if your family is alienated from the church Absolutely. and the celebration of the Eucharist would be complicated, um, or if or if it's been difficult to arrange the church, I mean there are there are any number of possibilities, right? Always. Any serious factors that, that could be at play here. One of the things I love is that there's always for you know the the celebrant, the priest, that there's a lot of latitude given because we understand that there's so many different um, dynamics that are involved when two individuals and then uh, at the end of the day, two families are coming together. There's a lot. So there's always pastoral provisions. Mm -hmm. So the celebrant can say like, okay, for a pastoral reason, we're going to actually withhold this aspect or for a pastoral reason, we're actually going to introduce something here. Keeping the integrity of the sacraments is always a must and a non-negotiable, but there's a lot of latitude understanding there's so many different uh, dynamics and circumstances of things can go all over the place. You know, there's um, one of those things is we look for, and now we're saying how to plan a Catholic wedding. One of the major suggestions we make is that it's a minimum of a six month engagement, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, right? Mm -hmm. So we don't want immediate like kind of shotgun weddings. We don't want somebody to just immediately jump into something. We look for a minimum of six months. Mm -hmm. That's kind of rule of thumb. But for certain circumstances, that can be abbreviated or things like that. I'm thinking of sometimes uh, yeah, if someone's I'm, being deployed. I was I know a military a couple deployment. Of you helped recently, yeah. In that regard, um, what about if a Catholic wants to get married um, outside of the church? By mm -hmm. outside of the church, I mean either not in the church mm -hmm. or with someone officiating who's not a priest. Are either of those things ever permissible? Yeah, given certain circumstances, right, and we would have to do that investigation. That investigation is done with the priest, um, and there has to be a dispensation um, given. Looking at what is being proposed, you know, sometimes if it's being married in uh, your spouse is Lutheran, right, and you want to get married in her hometown church, right, um, there can be the recognition of what's going to be taking place is still uh, the sacrament is still withheld in its integrity, and so there's a dispensation of, of the form that's given while recognizing the, the integrity of the sacrament is still respected and being communicated at that moment. So those are investigations that always need to be led by the priest and not self-led by the couple, mm -hmm. right? And this is why talking to your local pastor and still going through marriage prep, Catholic marriage prep, um, is very, very important because those things do get ironed out in, in, along the way. One of the uh, one of the things that I think is so interesting about this is that you have a lot of Catholics today asking, "Well, do I have to get married in the church?" Whereas a hundred years ago, 
uh, there were people who couldn't get married in the church. So for so before the reforms of the Second Vatican Council, yeah, the church would not allow um, uh-huh. a Catholic to marry a non-Catholic at the altar, right <laughs> inside a Catholic church, which is now which is now uh, permissible. So so now we've now we've got like the opposite cultural. Oh, you went from one extreme on. to the other, a thousand so, percent. So in those cases, like what would happen? And and you probably maybe listeners have these stories in their own families where yeah. someone was married in the front room of a rectory mm-hmm. or in a sacristy. Oh, the sacristy um, wedding is a classic <laughs> move. And you'll you'll see, you can see if you look in the old marriage registers, you can see notations about this. Uh-huh, you know uh-huh. and, um, where where the wedding took place. So I, so I think that's kind of an interesting thing that now we've got people who who um, who want to maybe protect their own standing within the church, but don't really want a church ceremony. And and we're in the, we're in like the opposite situation that we mm-hmm. were in a hundred years ago, where where people did want a church ceremony and and weren't permitted. So. Right. And I also think, too, like I've done a number of weddings. This kind of was initiated with COVID, Mm -hmm. um, but I I think it's not a bad thing um, to do very small intimate ceremonies. Oh, yeah. Oh, my gosh. No, they are the best. Yes. I will will suggest this. Like I said, some of my good friends, this was a, a COVID thing, and they were like just our family. And then then they went on their honeymoon. And then, like, maybe it was a month or a month and a half later, then they had their reception with everybody, the big party, because they were like, we have the opportunity then to invite people into our marriage mm-hmm. that's already been established and already been lived out for a small amount of time versus the day of where it's like, we have any, we have no idea what it's like to be husband and wife. We're not enjoying this marriage and everybody's celebrating it, but, like, it's just way too front-loaded. So I think that's an option that I, w- I would like to throw out there to like listeners is don't be afraid to have a small intimate ceremony with, you know, loved ones or just family. Go on the honeymoon and plan a party later. And that can give you a, so much freedom to be present at the sacrament. Mm-hmm. Right. And you don't have all the stress of the chaos of all of that. That's for a few weeks later. You know, that's a month, month and a half down the road. That'll be a big party later on. And we can then focus and be present to the party instead of thinking about anything else. So I think that's a really good, um, I don't know, thing that came about after COVID that I I always suggest to people. Please save your money. I mean, the the cost of weddings today and what couples spend on it. I I mean, this is a a serious moral question, and it's something that every bride and groom really needs to to do some soul searching about, to ask, is this, is this really acceptable? Is this really in the best interest of our family? Yeah. You know, what if we were to, oh, I don't know, save our money and and instead buy a house instead of having this instead of having this uh, elaborate wedding reception? Or what what if what if we were to what if we were to give to the poor the amount of money and the equal amount of money that we were going to spend on our wedding reception? Yeah. You know, if you if you say no, we're we're gonna we're gonna tithe big in this way. Or even just to say we're going to tithe uh, to the church or to the poor ten percent of what we spend on our wedding. I think that's a, that's a beautiful uh, way to do it. You know, to 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 really think seriously about what what you're giving to God in gratitude for the day mm-hmm. is important, and to think about how that day is going to influence and mark the rest of your life. As you know, as we were talking about at the top of the episode, mm-hmm. a wedding is about the beginning of something, not yes. the end, not the end of something. <laughs> it's not like I've accomplished like the level, you know, like in the video game, you know, like you go through all the levels and it's like now dating, dating mode complete, you know, (laughs) like that's not what this is. This is the beginning of a whole journey and it's a beautiful journey and it's going to wreck you and it's intimate and it's vulnerable and it's exciting and there's new life brought into it and it's, it's sanctifying, it's holy and it's beautiful. But I I do think that like there's a way to enter into that celebrate celebration of that and feasting is a healthy part of our mm-hmm. Catholic life. Mm-hmm. You know, festivity is awesome. We love to party, you know, mm-hmm. and we party well. Like, we're good at it. And so we should party, like, in uh, in its totality. But to also then have that aspect of, like, okay, my tithing, you know, 10%. Mm-hmm. I think that's a really healthy thing to do is, like, okay, the amount of money I spend on my reception, like, am I going to, can I take 10% of that and give it either to the church or to the poor? that is now bringing that into the celebration as well. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I love that uh, suggestion. Um, so I just don't want to like shut down all celebrations, <laughs> but it's like 
Simplify it, please. Simplify <laughs> it is a very important thing because these things have gotten extravagant and again, for no apparent reason. Again, in the old days, you know, you would get married in the morning. Yeah. Because there weren't vigil masses. So you would mm-hmm. get married in the morning and have like a light brunch or something. Um, and, th- and that was what most people did. You know, it was much simpler. And that, that was not just because we were immigrants and our parents were, were just beginning their families. They didn't have any money, that I, although I'm sure that was obviously part of it. But, but that was also just the custom. You know, guys wore morning coats because yeah. the masses were in the morning. So, so just a word about um, a, a word of advice, a word of caution, a word of encouragement to, to simplify. And that can be a great balm, you know, as you were saying, Joseph Anthony, to brides and grooms who are particularly anxious right. about having to coordinate all of this. You, you should f- feel free to, sympath- um, to simplify. Any other, like, final words of advice to would-be brides and would-be grooms? <laughs> Excuse me. Yeah, um, I would just in, encourage them to be patient. Mm. The period of engagement for many couples is the toughest period in the relationship. It's very stressful. <laughs> it's horrible. And it's a big question that I've worked with many couples with. And to be honest, there's not super like pithy answers to give. But that period of engagement is still a period of growth and maturity of the relationship. Mm. So many uh, couples enter into the period of engagement and immediately start planning the wedding and immediately start like, I can't tell you the amount of students that get engaged and they bring the families together to celebrate the engagement at the dinner in the first question that is asked to the couple is, so when are you getting married? <laughs> it's like, just let them be f- engaged. Let them mm-hmm. be fiancés. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You know, mm-hmm. the, the details will find there'll be an appropriate time to commit to a date. There'll be an appropriate time to commit to a color palette for the bridesmaids' dresses, mm. you know? But take that easy. The, just there is no immediacy or an urgency. Like allow the engagement period to be a true period of growth and a deepening of the knowledge of your fiance. Because the more that you know them, the more you're able to love them. Mm-hmm. And and that can be very, very difficult because the temptation is the period of engagement is about planning an event engagement's not about event planning okay engagement's actually about intimacy Mm. and so for all the couples out there that are thinking how do i plan this wedding i'm thinking about proposing or things like that my my number one thing of advice is take a deep breath be patient and don't immediately jump to event planning when it comes to engagement my last word is go timeless oh yes (laughs) have traditional music you know choose traditional things to wear Go timeless mm-hmm. because um, you know when you when you look back at those photos oh, from the oh, '70s and '80s, that's that's a bit that's a bit rough for some of them. Mm-hmm. Uh, but um, you know, there, there's something to be said for entering into the traditions of our of our parents, of our grandparents, of our great grandparents, uh-huh. and allowing those things to be lived through um, our lives, both in the things we choose to wear, in the music, in the general tenor of the celebration. And that that um, timelessness, that tradition is about embracing all of the things which which have formed our families, yeah. which have led us to uh, the, the the current moment where a bride and a groom are beginning their own family. Mm-hmm. Um, so so the, that celebration of family life of tradition, I think, has has a special pride of place always in Catholic decision making, <laughs> but especially yeah. as we plan our weddings. I got one last quick hitter of advice. When it comes to the exchange of rings, you don't have to put the ring all the way onto the finger. <laughs> just put it just up to that like first knuckle or so. She can put the ring the rest of the way on. I, I remember one groom trying to like force the the wedding band the ring, and she was like, "Ah!" I was like, "Okay, easy." You know. Well, thank you for that very inspiring know, last yeah. piece of advice. I love to leave the practical tips at the end. So. Thanks for listening to this episode of God's Planning. Follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Like, subscribe, and leave a five-star review. If you'd like to donate to the podcast through Patreon, follow the link in the description. You can also follow the links in the description to shop God's Planning merch and to get information on upcoming God's Planning events. Please know, listeners, of our prayers for you, and we ask for your prayers for us. God bless. Mm-hmm.